One morning in 1995, two campers were inside of their little nylon tent inside of this huge forest in Arizona when they started to hear this loud rumbling sound. So curious, they unzipped their tent and they looked in the direction the sound was coming from and it was coming from this dirt road kind of straight up ahead of them. And at first, all they could see was this huge dirt and dust cloud kind of barreling towards them. And then in the middle of this cloud, suddenly something appeared that both of these campers knew should not have been in this forest. And so seconds later, this thing blew past them and disappeared into the trees in the other direction. And for a moment, the two campers had no idea what to do. They began to kind of rationalize why this thing was here. But before they got very deep into that conversation, they began hearing the rumbling sound again. And they looked, and sure enough, the big thing was coming back. But before we get into that story, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right place because that's all we do, and we upload once a week. So if that's of interest to you, please replace the like button's maple syrup with brake fluid. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. Okay, let's get into today's story. May 27, 1995, a long-haul truck driver named Devin Williams pulled his gigantic refrigerated semi-truck into a truck stop in a city called Kingman, Arizona. After putting his truck in park, Devin reached over and grabbed his sleeping bag off the passenger seat and began to unroll it. Devin would normally get out and use the bathroom and brush his teeth before going to sleep for the night, but this night, Devin was so exhausted that instead of going in, he just unfurled that sleeping bag and then climbed behind the front two seats of his truck and got into what's called the sleeper cab, which is an area behind the front two seats in the cab where drivers can lay down and rest. Devin had been on the road for the last four days, basically non-stop, and all he wanted to do was just finish the stupid route and get back home to his wife, Mary Lou, and their three kids in the tiny town of Americus in Kansas. Devin hated being away from his family for long periods of time, which unfortunately was part of his job being a long-haul truck driver, but they needed the money because he and his wife had just bought a new house, and it was a total fixer-upper, and so they needed to do a whole bunch of repairs to turn that house into a home. And so, missing his family and just wishing he was done with this route, Devin laid in his sleeping bag in the sleeper cab trying to fall asleep, but he just couldn't. And unfortunately, as Devin knew, if he didn't sleep this night, then he would have to take another break later on on this route to rest because he couldn't just continue to drive with absolutely no sleep. And so taking an additional break that he was not prepping for could affect his ability to get home on time. It was Saturday night, and the strawberries and lettuce that Devin was hauling inside of his truck were due in Kansas City, Missouri, 1,300 miles away, on Monday morning. So Devin began doing the math in his head. If he stopped a little while later to take another sleep break, would he still be able to cover those 1,300 miles by Monday? And he just wasn't sure. Everybody at the trucking company where Devin worked knew the 29-year-old as being very easygoing and good-natured. Trucking was very hard. People drove insanely long hours on very little sleep, and some people even took drugs to stay awake even longer to make sure they hit their deadlines. And so truckers have kind of earned the reputation of being very rough and tough people. And Devin certainly looked rough and tough. He was this big guy who wore cowboy hats. He had a big Fu Manchu mustache. He had tattoos. But in reality, despite how he looked, he was actually like a gentle giant. And really all he talked about were his kids, who he was totally devoted to. The only time anyone at this company saw Devin get mad was when his work interfered with his ability to see his family. And now, as Devin tossed and turned inside of a sleeper cab, he was getting mad because he was thinking, this stupid route and his inability to sleep during this particular break was very likely going to interfere with seeing his family. And after an hour of Devin getting angrier and angrier and so not sleeping at all, he finally just gave up on sleep. He chucked his sleeping bag, he climbed out of the cab, and he headed into the truck stop where he went to the bathroom, he got a bite to eat, 
then he called his boss, and he told him that he had just made a stop in order to sleep, but he couldn't, and so he was just going to hit the road again, but don't worry, even though I need another break in order to sleep, I will be in Kansas City on Monday morning with this delivery on time. After speaking to his boss, Devin left the truck stop, climbed back into his truck, he fired it up, and then before long, he was back on the highway, driving east. Devin's boss was a guy named Tom Wilson, and he didn't find anything unusual about this phone call he got from Devin. Maybe it was a little unusual that Devin was unable to sleep, and that he called his boss to say he was unable to sleep, but Devin sounded totally normal. And so that night, Tom was not worried at all that Devin would not make it to Kansas City by Monday morning. Devin was like one of his most reliable guys, and so Devin said he was going to be there on Monday morning, even if he needed extra breaks along the way, then he would be there on Monday morning. But on Monday morning, the distribution center in Kansas City, Missouri, where Devin was supposed to go and drop off the lettuce and strawberries, called Tom Wilson and they said, hey, your driver's not here yet. What's going on? Now, at first, Tom was actually really annoyed with the distribution center because he felt like, okay, the clock has just struck the deadline. Devin will likely arrive in the next few minutes and they're prematurely calling to complain. And so Tom communicated that to the distribution center and they said, okay, fine, we'll wait a little bit longer. But when almost an hour passed and still Devin had not shown up, the distribution center called Tom back and said, hey, he's not here. Now, after the second call, Tom totally changed his mindset and he was actually now worried about Devin. And so he apologized to the distribution center and said he would get in touch with Devin as soon as he could and figure out where their shipment was. But Tom couldn't just call Devin and ask where he was and what was going on because this was back in 1995. They didn't have cell phones. And so Tom basically just had to wait for Devin, who's out on the road somewhere, to stop somewhere and call Tom to tell tell Tom what's going on. And so all day Monday, Tom sat at his desk waiting for a call from Devin. And when he didn't get a call from Devin, Tom began calling his other drivers all over the country, asking them if maybe they had had some sort of interaction with Devin and knew where he was and why he had not made it to Kansas City on time. But none of the drivers had any idea what was going on with Devin. No one had spoken to him. Then that evening, Tom got a call, but it was not from Devin. It was from Devin's wife, Mary Lou, and she was calling to say, where's Devin? He was supposed to be home by now, and he's not. I haven't heard from him in days. What's going on? And at this, Tom suddenly thought, okay, we have a real problem here. And so when Tom explained to Mary Lou what was going on with Devin, how he had missed this deadline, Mary Lou panicked and immediately called the police. A little while later, a police officer in America's Kansas arrived at Mary Lou's house to take down the missing person report. And after they did that, the deputy assured Mary Lou that very likely her husband would be found and he would be just fine. And so they explained to Mary Lou that what they would do is put out an alert to all the different police departments that fell kind of roughly along the route that Devin's truck had been on and see if any of them had had some sort of interaction with Devin. You know, maybe he got into an accident, maybe his truck broke down and he was stranded somewhere, you know, maybe he was hospitalized, who knows? But very likely, one of these police departments would know where Devin was. And sure enough, after this alert went out, the officer got a call back very quickly from a sheriff's department in a place called Coconino County, Arizona. Coconino County was located 200 miles to the east of Kingman, Arizona, which was where Devin had been on Saturday night but couldn't sleep and then called his boss to say he was going to hit the road again. But interestingly, the sheriff's department in Coconino County made it very clear to the police officer in America's Kansas that they had no idea where Devin was but they definitely knew where his truck was. In fact, basically everybody in Coconino County knew where Devin's truck was. It was all anybody in that county was talking about. Because on Sunday, so the day before Devin was reported missing, somebody driving Devin's truck spent the entire day terrorizing hikers and campers inside of the Tonto National Forest in Coconino County. The Tonto National Forest, which is 600,000 acres 
acres of just rugged wilderness preserve was nowhere near Devon's trucking route. In fact, it wasn't near any trucking route ever. It's like 20 miles off of the highway, and the roads in the forest are barely wide enough to support small cars going through, let alone a 48-foot-long, massive 10-ton semi-truck like Devon was driving. But on Sunday morning, so roughly eight hours after Devon had called his boss Tom, two hikers named Lynn and Jack Yarrington were in their tent inside of Tonto National Forest just having a nice time. It's peaceful, it's quiet, and they're right near this dirt road that kind of bent around a corner. And suddenly, they began to hear a rumbling sound coming from one end of this road. And so they were in their tent, they unzipped it, they looked out, and at first, all they saw on the road coming in their direction was this huge cloud of dust and smoke. And then through the dust and smoke came Devin's humongous truck blazing down this road at practically full speed. And at first, Jack and Lynn are like, how is this truck even in the forest? How did it get here? How did it actually manage to drive to this point? And after Devin's truck whizzed past them and blazed off in the other direction out of sight, Lynn and Jack weren't scared or worried. They were just totally confused. And so they began speculating, you know, like, well, maybe the driver got lost and they're trying to find a place to turn around or something. And sure enough, a couple of minutes later, they heard a rumbling sound and they saw another cloud of dust and it was Devin's truck now coming back in the other direction on the same dirt road. And so Jack and Lynn, they kind of backed up behind their tent and they watched as this truck blazed past them again, flying out the other direction. And so in some ways that kind of confirmed to Lynn and Jack that yes, you know, this driver who's definitely driving recklessly at this point has likely gotten lost. They've managed to turn around and now they're heading back out to the highway and that's all this was. And then all of a sudden, as they're kind of chatting about it and laughing about it, they hear the sound of the truck coming back again. And they look up and sure enough, there's Devin's truck barreling down the road again. Except this time, Jack and Lynn, they looked where Devin's truck was going and they saw there was a small sedan coming up the road in the opposite direction. So Devin and the sedan are going to collide. And because this road was actually on a turn, the driver of the sedan couldn't actually see the truck and the driver of the truck, whether it was Devin or somebody else, couldn't see the sedan. And so both drivers are driving towards each other without realizing it. And so Jack and Lynn, they jump up, they begin screaming and yelling at the driver of the truck to slow down, but the truck didn't slow down. It just continued coming down the road and the sedan driver, he saw Jack and Lynn flailing their arms and trying to get somebody to stop on the road. And so sensing there was another car, the sedan came to a full stop and then right in front of them they saw this truck come barreling around the road and so the sedan began backing up wildly trying to get out of the way of this huge truck and then finally the driver of the sedan just cut the wheel and peeled off the side of the road into the brush and right as they did the truck which had not slowed down at all even though the driver could have clearly seen the sedan just whizzed right past the sedan and would have smashed into it if the sedan had not jumped off the road the driver driver of the sedan got out of the car, and when Jack and Lynn ran up to him to make sure he was okay, he would tell them that he got a good look at the driver of the truck as he drove past him, and he told them that the driver was just gripping the wheel, looking totally straight ahead, no expression whatsoever, just barreling past him. It was like he didn't even look at the sedan. He was just going. A little later that day, and not far from where this incident had just happened on this road with Jack and Lynn and the sedan, there was this family that was hiking through Tonto National Forest and they had arrived at this big beautiful open field in the middle of the forest and they planned to have a picnic in this field. But as they came out of the tree line and walked into this beautiful open high grass meadow area, they looked out and they saw just kind of in the middle of the field was this huge truck that made no sense. How in the world could this truck have gotten to this meadow? They didn't know. But they clearly saw there's a truck and the father of the family, he saw there was a man standing next to this truck, just kind of looking away from them off at the mountains in the distance. And so this family kind of assumed that the driver of this truck had somehow gotten into this meadow and maybe their truck was stuck and so now they need help. And so the father told his family to stay put for a second and then he, on his own, walked across the meadow towards this truck. And as the father got closer, he did see that very 
clearly the truck was stuck in the mud. And so this driver very likely is stranded. And so as he got close enough, the father yelled out to this guy and said, hey, do you need some help? You know, we can go back and call someone. You know, what can we do for you? But the man who was standing outside of the truck didn't even turn around to talk to this father. He just kept standing there motionless, looking off into the distance. And so the father made it about five or six feet away from this guy. And the father just stopped and very clearly said, hey, I'm talking to you. Do you need help? And at this point, the man who was standing next to the truck, he turned around and he looked at the father. And immediately the father kind of backed up for a second because there was something off about this guy. The guy was just kind of standing there and he was staring at the father and he opened his mouth like he was about to speak. But instead of speaking, he just kept opening his mouth wider and wider until it was as wide as he could get it. And then he began wiggling his lower jaw back and forth as fast as he could and then clicking his teeth simultaneously. And so the father just began backing up like there was something wrong with this guy and right as the father was about to just turn around and leave and go protect his family from this guy the guy stopped with his mouth and then he just stared directly at the father and said very calmly i didn't do it they did it now when the father heard this he was already so weirded out by this guy that he didn't even have any questions to follow up with instead he just turned and began running back towards his family and so feeling very unsettled the family they ran back to their car they drove back home and they called the police about this guy in his truck it would take a deputy from the coconino county sheriff's department a little while to finally navigate their way all the way out to this meadow where this truck and this guy apparently were and when the deputy he got there, they walked out into this meadow, and sure enough, just like the father had said, there was the truck stuck in the mud. And so the deputy began walking out to the truck, expecting to see the driver, this guy who the father had said was acting totally weird. But when the deputy got up there, he found the truck was totally abandoned. There was nobody in the cab, there was nobody nearby, it was just sitting here, but it was still running. And so the deputy tried to open up the cab, but it was locked. He did look inside, and every Everything looked very neat and orderly. And then he went around to the back of the truck and he opened up the back doors and he found the refrigeration unit was still on. And inside of this truck was lots and lots of strawberries and lettuce. So the deputy really didn't know what to make of this truck in the middle of the field, combined with this report that the father gave about this guy who was standing near it, acting totally weird. And so he just checked the license plate of the truck and he ran it against his database to see if there were any matching reports of missing trucks or missing truck drivers, but there weren't any. Because remember, this is on Sunday this is happening, and it wasn't until the next day, Monday, that Devin was reported missing, and his truck was added to a list of missing trucks and missing truck drivers. And so, the Coconino County deputy just called a towing company, who came out and hauled Devin's truck out of the forest. And then, 24 hours later, when Devin was reported missing, the Coconino County Sheriff's Department put it all together and contacted the officer in America's Kansas to say, okay, we do have Devin's truck, but we don't have any other answers for you. The behavior of the man who was driving Devin's truck through Tonto National Forest was so insanely out of character for someone like Devin that it seemed totally impossible that Devin could have done this. But both Lynn and Jack Yarrington and the other people who saw this truck flying through the forest on that Sunday, they all insisted that the man they saw in the cab driving this truck matched the picture of Devin Williams. But there was absolutely no reason for why Devin would want to go to the Tonto National Forest. And even if he did want to go to this forest for some reason, he should have known that his massive semi-trailer truck was not a good choice choice to be driving around these narrow dirt roads in the middle of this wilderness preserve. All we know about Devin is that at the time he went missing, all he likely wanted to do was just get home to America's Kansas to be with his wife and three kids again. That's really all he cared about. The police did consider that, you know, maybe Devin just ran away, but that theory didn't add up. Devin had no criminal record. He had a great relationship with his wife, so there were no issues there, and there were no other 
kind of outstanding relationship issues with friends or family. And financially, even though it was a little tight, they were doing just fine. They just wanted some extra money to fix up this house and make it really nice. It wasn't like they were struggling to put food on the table. Also, the police considered that, you know, maybe Devin was kidnapped or something. But Devin is like this big, imposing, tattooed, cowboy hat, big mustache, tough truck driver. I mean, who's going to try to kidnap that guy? Devin also had no medical issues. He wasn't struggling with his mental health. He had no neurological abnormalities. He also never used drugs and always passed every single drug test that he got while working for this trucking company. Devin was basically just this totally normal, nice, well-adjusted guy with nothing to run or hide from. And so none of this made any sense. Police mounted a massive search inside of Tonto National Forest. And during the search, the couple, Jack and Lynn Yarrington, who had seen the truck barreling up and down the road and nearly collide with that sedan, they would tell searchers that they actually thought they saw Devin Williams, not in his truck, but out on foot, walking around on Monday morning. So just hours before he would have been reported missing, they said they just saw this guy wandering barefoot down the road as they were driving out of the forest and they slowed down to ask him if he was okay and this guy who looked exactly like Devin Williams responded by picking up a rock and throwing it at their car and so Jack and Lynn just drove past him not realizing that this was the guy who very likely was driving that truck now the police when they began this search were pretty confident they would find Devin especially after hearing from Jack and Lynn that he was pretty likely on foot and without shoes walking around the forest it seemed like he could not get very far but despite this huge search they could not find Devin there was absolutely no trace of him and so after nearly three weeks of searching and not finding Devin the police called off the search then on May 2nd 1997 so almost exactly two years from when Devin had been reported missing two hikers were walking on this trail in the middle of Tonto National Forest right in the area where police had extensively searched for Devin two years earlier Earlier, these two hikers, they're walking on this trail, and up ahead they see there's this white thing right in the middle of the trail, just kind of sitting out. Now, this is a well-trafficked trail, and so they're wondering, you know, what is this thing? And so they walk up, and they see this white thing is a perfectly intact human skull. There's no skeleton, it's just the skull. And so these hikers, they gasp, they can't believe they're looking at a real human head, and they're thinking, you know, how in the world did it get here? Why hasn't anybody else seen this and taken it? Like, how are we the first ones to see this? And so they would end up calling the police. The police would come out. They'd gather up the skull. It would be sent in for testing. And sure enough, DNA testing would reveal the skull belonged to Devin Williams. No one has ever been able to explain what actually happened to Devin Williams. But the discovery of his skull inside of Tonto National Forest nearly guarantees that the driver of the truck two years earlier really was Devin, and the guy standing outside of the truck that was stuck in the mud in the meadow was likely Devin, and the guy throwing rocks at Jack and Lynn's car was Devin. People have put forth a whole host of theories about what happened to Devin, ranging from he had some sort of medical event where he kind of lost his mind and that's what caused all this strange behavior, or maybe Devin was on drugs despite not having any history of drug use, you know, maybe he took a really strong drug and that's what caused him to do all this, and still others believe that maybe there's a paranormal element to this whole story, that perhaps Devin was contacted by aliens and that's what induced all the bizarre behavior, and then ultimately he was abducted by said aliens, and then somehow his skull wound up back on this trail in the middle of Tonto National Forest. And as crazy as that sounds, still to this day, no one has any idea of what happened to him, so that theory is just as good as any other. So that's going to do it. If you enjoyed today's story, be sure to check out our podcast called the Mr. Ballin Podcast, where we have literally hundreds more stories just like this one available exclusively on Amazon Music.